Hello, hello, and welcome to Art Pop Talk. I'm Gianna. And I'm Bianca. How you doing? <laughs> I'm good. Gianna, I went to Final Cut yesterday. Oh, I know you did. Eek! It was so good. So, Gianna, do you want to tell everybody what Final Cut is? Like, how you heard about it? Well, of course I heard about it on TikTok because I don't do anything else with my life these days. <laughs> It just looks so cool. These two girls were walking around this big warehouse where, you know, there was like furniture, home decor, stuff that was qualified as like reject furniture, but really just mm -hmm. had probably was used as like a floor piece or a show piece or something that they just can't sell full price now for whatever reason. So you can get right. really cool stuff from anthropology and urban outfitters. And what's the other one? Is it uh, terrain and free people? I don't think free people has furniture, like but I think terrain is the other one that Final Cut yeah. houses. Yeah. Well, so Anthropology's headquarters are somewhere in Pennsylvania. I didn't make Philly. that up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was so cool. And when I was up there with you, I was like, oh my God, we have to go to this place. But unfortunately, it's not like a normal store. So they only have selective dates of when they're open so the stars did not align for me to make it to final cut but did you buy anything yes i got a blue velvety chair it's like royal blue it's really pretty there was a lot of other stuff that i really liked but i learned a lot from going this time so i feel like if i wanted to go again i might do things a little bit differently because it's two days and i went the second day and they said mm -hmm. a lot of the other kind of like homey stuff maybe smaller stuff than the bigger kind of couches and chairs and things like that really go quickly on the first day but it was really actually really fun i had a great time and i got a great new chair i'm really excited i'm also glad that i didn't find anything else that I really needed to have because the chair was really the only thing that fit in my car. I definitely underestimated <laughs> the size of my car space, <laughs> but the chair fit perfectly. I'm so Good. excited. So now I can, I got rid of the pops on today, Gianna. Oh my gosh. Okay. When you sent me that snap, I freaking died. I channel your inner Bobby. <laughs> so in college, I got this pops on chair and when I moved it, you know, I just took all my furniture with me, whatever. And the the blue chair that I got at Final Cut is what replaced the Papazon. But there's an episode of Queer Eye in the latest season when they're in Philadelphia. And Bobby says something like, I love a good Papazon chair. And he just sits in it. And he's like, I'm going to throw this away. <laughs> Oh my god, and he's so cute when he like sits down in it and he gets all cozy and then he's like, nah, bitch, this is going in the trash. <laughs> <laughs> so I was able to give mine away for free on Marketplace, which was exciting. That's great. You know, it lasted you through those college days and it was time to part ways. Yes, yes, it was. So what about you? What have you been doing? Oh gosh, well, I have been bopping around the house. I've actually been helping mom do some stuff. I say helping. I'm mostly just watching and actually not being very helpful. But she finished putting up all this side paneling and flooring in the hallways because she is a talented woman that can do all this stuff herself. Incredible. But yeah, mm -hmm. it's looking really good got like wood floors in the hallway now and she's about to stain the like wood siding so that's been nice. exciting i also have an interview coming up this week because i am also a woman of many talents so totally there's that so been a little busy prepping for that but really other than that i've just been bopping around watching a lot of news because of course the big news this week was that right. Joe Biden announced Kamala Harris will be his VP. So I'm just very much mentally preparing for also Monday. We're recording on Sunday, which is a uh, Democratic convention. And then just yes. November in general, if I'm being honest. Yep. <laughs> so it's going to come here quick and we got to we got to get ready. We definitely do. And now that that decision has been made, get your knowledges in. <laughs> 
Get registered to vote, everybody. Make sure you can get a mail-in ballot if you can. Also, mm -hmm. ask your government to allow you to have a mail-in ballot. Fun stuff to look forward to. For sure. But actually, some other fun things that happened this week was I have been bopping to Cardi and Megan's WAP and Miley's new song, Midnight Sky, which is her latest breakup anthem. Bianca, I'm sure that you have listened to both. Girl, of course I did. <laughs> okay, so I just need to tell you that I did start practicing the WAP TikTok dance. Oh, God. <laughs> and I'm going to keep practicing, but if I work on it enough, maybe I can post it on our APT TikTok. Well, you, you can absolutely do whatever you want. I will not be doing that. I'm scared to try it because people are like breaking <laughs> shit. I know. Did you see the that? girl that went to the hospital? Yes, I did. <laughs> I do not want to go to the hospital. I applaud you wanting to try, but... I'll, I'll let you tackle that one on your own. It's been fun. But I have to say the TikToks are killing me with WAP with like the uvula. <laughs> and they're like that little dangling thing that's swinging in the back, back of my throat. Of my throat. <laughs> it's incredible. And they, they do the little face with just like the eyes and the mouth. And they're just like the Is uvula. Is this who we are? <laughs> Is this who we are? <laughs> Also, Gianna has mom heard it because can you please do the TikTok where people play it for their parents? Oh my god, absolutely not. Um, I, please. I don't know if she has or we haven't talked about it, but I do know what you're talking about. It's like, ooh, I told my parents WAP standard for like worship and prayer <laughs> or something. And so they now put it in their bio. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I've been seeing like people film their parents' reactions when they listen to the song for the first time. And one of them played it for like their little grandma. And she was so cute. And grandma was just like vibing on the couch. And then after it ended, she was like, that reminds me of better days. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dead. I was no. like, okay, I'll send it to you. Yeah, please do. Um, so what do you think of Miley's new song? And did you notice that in the video she is wearing Chanel? I did. I did. I did. I did. I was like, come on, Miley. You know better. You can- Well, girl, it's just like one of- We knew this going into the Chanel episode that it once you see it or once you know this information, it's you can't look at it the same way again. And although right. this is information that is out there, it's still- yeah. isn't i would not still consider it common knowledge because i no. was completely oblivious to it you know prior to our episode with jewel <laughs> right thank you jewel you no know, i did notice she was wearing some chanel get up but honestly i i don't not like it i like it better than breaks like a heart breaks like a heart wasn't my oh, yeah like all-time favorite miley song so oh. i think we're like getting back up into a better direction i thought it was really cool that she didn't she direct the music she video? She directed the video, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it was, like, very Miley, very pretty. Like, I love her glam. Like, she's yeah, gorgeous. Well, that's what I was going to say. Like, watching the video aesthetically, it felt like a return to the banger's looks. Mm hmm But I was personally a very big fan of the Younger Now Miley era. Yes. I love Younger Now. Um, I also really like bangers, if I'm being honest. Like, I love bangers. No, I, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I love bangers. Um, yeah, but I loved Younger Now, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just, you know, I love to see her doing her, and yeah, I thought the video was, like, really beautiful, glam. I'm all about it, but I just think, in general, the last song that I really like loved by her was off of the um younger now era so what about she's coming mother's daughter or catitude oh, shoot I forgot about she is coming I mean a mother's daughter okay then it would be yeah mother's daughter yeah I like catitude oh I know you do <laughs> 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 okay, so Bianca, as always, we have quite a few things to cover today, 
But to start things off, we were really very excited to see how much engagement we were receiving from last week's episode and talking mm-hmm. about celebrity art collections in relationship to the insight we received in the AD Open Door videos. So we are going to kick things off today in our intro discussion by continuing to talk about last week's episode and actually share some wonderful insights from one of our listeners in order to keep up this dialogue that we love to have with the art pop tarts. Indeed. So Indeed. I was Indeed. was t- <laughs> talking to someone about the episode and they were sharing some totally valid points about us potentially affirming ideas in Jenner's home that we didn't like in Lance's home. So I'm going to read a, a text message from this person. They said, quote, if there's going to be any sort of push in the quote unquote everydayness or art in space that is to be experienced daily, like what was being said in a meditative fashion or just in the idea of unspoken thought or experience, then its ownership there can easily be an argument and a switch in the case that makes the visual medium now valued as material. It can definitely be valued or esteemed in higher quality or meaning, but the daily life art being art just as such then needs to be seen when Lance also touches his pieces and hangs them on top of a stove as much as one may not like it and knows better. LOL. LOL indeed. (laughs) Lols. Lols. So then... They also said, by fundamentally owning the material, you now reserve the right to do whatever the hell you want with it. Now, I know ethically there's a discussion that arises in what it is that you do with it and how you treat it, but Lance Armstrong rubbing his hands over a piece, that's his ability to do so because he owns that piece. The other critique I have is the idea that it's portrayed that he doesn't have any sort of sentimental value or a deepened meaning towards these pieces that he owns. However, I think in passing through a quote-unquote tour, as he's doing in something that is as transactional as an architectural digest tour, he might just refer to these artists as a friend. And that's kind of how you're going to have to see this rationale as he's bringing you through a house that is fundamentally just a material game for him. Yes, yes, yes. So I think these comments are very insightful and mostly because they're helping to press this idea that if you own that artwork, you do have the right or are in the right to do what you will with that piece because it's now yours now. And this is one of those things within talking about private collections that this is the reality of how the art world works. Whether we like it or agree with it at all times, these collectors are in their right to interact and display their collection however they would like. So to recap the conversation from last week, yes, absolutely. First off, we need to understand that all these celebrities are doing the same things. They are collecting art because they like it, they feel connected to it, they have the means to be patrons of high-profile artists, and sometimes may be collecting the object to fit their aesthetic purposes or for the name attached to the objects. And in the case of Lance, for example, some pieces were gifted. So again, this is how the art market works. And we also need our collectors to keep, store, preserve, house, and be patrons and supporters to the artists as well. That's Mm -hmm. a big part in how all this works. Right. But what we are critiquing, and I think why we pressed other celebrity collectors harder than others, like Lance Armstrong, is although I appreciate that he's being a patron and a supporter of a variety of artists, and even though it is in his right to display works however he likes, I think we still should constantly be reevaluating those methods of purchasing and displaying art and thinking about what our art and collected items really mean. Right. So from an installment and preservation perspective, Gianna, I totally see what you mean. I've had 
other personal experiences with private collectors who just have so much amazing art. For example, a gold belt from 17th century Uzbekistan. And casual. it's kept casual and it's kept in a Ziploc bag in their garage. And from my own privileged perspective, just as a person who has the ability to study and work and with the maintenance of art objects, I get frustrated and sad when I see this happening because the Dr. Indiana Jones in me mm. wants all of these objects to be taken care of. But that's just not how it works. And I think we were harsh in our last episode being quick to judge Lance Armstrong on how he interacts, displays, and takes care of his own things. They're his objects. He bought them. And it's not fair for us to judge that harshly, unknowingly, about his own home or to tell him what we think we know about his home in that manner. In the second half of today's episode, we'll be talking about the artist Kehinde Wiley. Remember, this was an artist that Lance brought up, the piece that hangs above the stove in the kitchen. Now, to put into some context why I was maybe thrown off by Lance's brief description of the work when he mentioned, oh, Wiley did the Obama portrait, is because there's so much depth and cultural upheaval and a disruption of our systems and institutions present throughout Wiley's body of work, which is exactly why it's so important that he did do the Obama portrait. And I don't want to dwell on this piece too much because there is a ton of information you can easily find about the work and collaboration he did with Obama. But I think this is why Gianna and I were so shocked when we watched the video because for us, it felt like we were forgetting the major cultural work Wiley is constantly asking us to put in when looking at his pieces. His work is so incredibly revolutionary and calls out so much of the Western art historical canon. And while none of that work is negated by the association with Obama, Wiley is now, maybe because of that commission, I think one of the biggest names in contemporary art, also for people who may not be involved in the contemporary art scene as much. And I think I'm scared of just knowing the name and not the content behind that. Just because I, as an art historian, am privy to that knowledge and that body of work. But alas, that is our world. And that's what we're talking about here on our Pop Talk. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, the art world. But that is also part of the reason why we started this podcast and why we want to have these conversations is because we're naturally always going to be able to use and come from this perspective perspective of using our art historical knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so any time we're ever broaching a discussion about anything, it's always going to come from this perspective and we're, we have to use that insider knowledge that we have to help break down this barrier that we always talk about within the art world on mm -hmm. our pop talk. So also in regards to what you said, our reaction again is, is also not because white people or people of any kind of, you know, point of privilege can't own works by Wiley, obviously, because we should be recognizing and supporting the work by black and queer contemporary artists. But yeah, I absolutely. think through today's discussion, the complexity of the placement and also the irony behind why we critique the location of this piece within the home will become all the more clear as we talk about, again, in Wiley's work and as you said, Bianca, his dissection of the Western canon. Yeah. In terms of the other critique about us dismissing Lance's personal and sentimental value to these objects as well, I think is totally fair. After I even listened to the episode, I was like, maybe we were a little harsh, you know? And again, that that is me getting frustrated because what I saw someone doing just wasn't the way that I have been taught as a museum professional to handle art objects. And I, I want to talk about that with you guys because that is how I feel. And Gianna, I think you're right. 
mm-hmm. this is what we know. We know our history museum studies. But this person is totally right in calling me out because at the same time, I do believe, and they might laugh at me saying this, that subjectivity matters and people can appreciate art in different forms in their own way. And even in Gianna and I have talked about how art doesn't always have to be so serious and we can like things and not like things just because, and that's okay. So I would like to apologize to Lance Armstrong Hmm. for my heavy reaction to his home tour. And Lance, if you're listening, I think we should have you come on the show and talk with us about some of these issues because wouldn't it be cool to actually talk and discuss with one of the celebrities about the art of it all? Ooh, get into the art of it all. Um, The art of it all. Yeah, I would love to see it. But I, yeah, I think I agree with you. I mean we can get so like heated about things because especially after seeing the placement of the Wiley piece I think it was just like a snowball effect Mm -hmm. but also again because we are so hypersensitive and hypercritical to these things that we have access to you know they're they're always going to be more apparent for for people who are able to use this perspective that we have so Mm -hmm. going back also in regards to Kendall Jenner I think it's also fair to say that we were more drawn and more lenient on the installment of her collection even though again she is doing all these same things we listed she's collecting art because she likes it and because she feels connected to it she has the means to be a patron of high profile artists and using objects to fit her home's aesthetic So how can we make these different distinctions between home to home, celebrity to celebrity, collection to collection? Right. I mentioned not all of Lance Armstrong's pieces being focal points in his home, which again is completely within his own right. And I think it's also fair to say that not every piece of art that you own, especially when you collect that much, is going to be a focal point in your home. And that Mm -hmm. is completely okay. But when you have the ability to obtain works from groundbreaking and important contemporary artists, I think it's also fair to challenge and compare these installments if we want more transparency and care to take place within the art world, which is, I think, fundamentally the differences that I saw between Kendall's works and Lance's Mm -hmm. works. Let us also not forget that these celebrity home tours, because essentially our sources were from, you know, an architectural perspective, is that these people are also having interior designers come and help them set up their home at the same Mm -hmm. time. And, you know, as we're talking about this, I'm kind of thinking about even problems that museums have, like the amount of objects that museums have in storage that oh, I mean they're absolutely. they're taken care of and they're studied and they're documented for research purposes and art historians are allowed access but again that's that access is limited it's limited to people who study these objects and are asking to seek them out um, but just thinking about how Lance's objects are on display I don't know you know could be like the Uzbekistan belt in a garage situation Mm -hmm. where there's a lot not being um, highlighted or on display. But just thinking about, yeah, I mean, I get it's a problem or something to think about everywhere in, you know, where are all these objects? How often do they get shown? What happens to them when they're not on view? Right. Totally. Yeah. So I would agree with that. I, I think that's also the nature of these home tours, right? I think Gianna and I were just so impressed that in Kendall Jenner's home, these works were such a focal point for her, which led to some quicker judgments onto Lance because his weren't, and and that's maybe a fault within Gianna and I's interests. And I think there's also a lot of people who could say about Jenner's collection as well as a white privilege model that we really only considered this tension when we talked about the Barbara Kruger piece. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure that many people who do think similarly to us and study what we study would also find Jenner's collection problematic in different ways. This person who I was talking to is so incredibly smart and intelligent and can definitely teach me a lot about the concept of mindfulness. So I just wanted to bring up this other part of our 
conversation and it might be a little bit to process. It's taken me a while to kind of process these concepts. So here we go. And referencing human consciousness and precognitive theory, I think it's super important that you're talking about the sort of metacognitive perspectives that are going to come into awareness for Jenner in this space and what that means in the idea of material and space. So that's why I get very confused why you're still trying to negate the critique that was given to Jenner's house. Because the idea that it's supposed to be an everyday item and mindfulness of this sort of intrinsic arena completely shows you it's not an everyday item. What's the notation of that insurance in such an environment? However, when thinking about those who critique her, I doubt there is an everydayness to her house. I doubt there's an everydayness to the way she is living in that space, and therefore I'm so skeptical of it being used in capacities that cultivate such mindful behavior and metacognitive processes. Now, like I said, I have a lot more to learn about the study of mindfulness, and this is why in the episode I might prefer the concept of slow looking, particularly in reference to something like this and museum studies. In thinking about the stance this person took with Lance's home, and obviously they're not on the show right now to speak for themselves on this point, but I'm hesitant to use the word mindfulness because this person will totally school me on my using that word. But can Kendall not practice something like that because you don't think her home is used as an everyday space. I think this is a similar line of thought to that critique from Betches that they had was that they were doubting the functionality of the space and the piece because of Jenner's status. Now, I kind of have a problem with this because I guess the answer really is we, we don't know and we won't know because we're not in that space and we're also not Kendall Jenner and that might not be the best place to stop this conversation, but to continue learning and accepting other people's perspectives, thinking about, you know, the first conversation that Gianna and I had in comparison to some of the following discussions, maybe when it comes to something like private collections and celebrity culture, we're just not going to know, but we can still keep up this interconnected dialogue. I'm not going to know what Kendall space is actually functioning as, nor am I going to be able to know how Lance connects with his artwork, you know? I love what you said about looking at these collections and these homes from two different perspectives, because like you said, this isn't space that we actually are granted full access to. We're given limited insight to and using the, you know, resources that we have to quote, critique these spaces. But I think this is incredible because it goes to show just from coming from different lived experiences how someone can have a completely different interpretation of what is happening in that space that we do. And I also think that's to say that neither opinion is wrong or invalid. It's just that right. we quite frankly still don't know. I also like what they pointed out about the everydayness, and I hope from the last discussion too that by no means also did I ever think that this is not <laughs> an everyday object or something that we're going to find in everyday homes. We definitely know that collecting the kinds of artworks that Kendall has in her home are mm -hmm. definitely privileged objects and pieces of artworks to have in this mm -hmm. kind of space as as well. So again, we, we don't know exactly how she is practicing those reflective processes. I think that was especially good to press on the idea of the everydayness in the house mm -hmm. and and also debating, you know, how that takes place and what that looks like. <laughs> What is everydayness? Because my everydayness is going to be different from your everydayness. Well, it is. And just from having two different lived experiences, even if it is by day to day like that, this mm -hmm. just goes to show how that's why art can be so subjective. Like this is a perfect right. example of that. Right. 
So what can we take away from looking at all of these celebrity home tours? Why did Gianna and I even feel it was worth discussing in the first place? Originally, Gianna just kind of called me and said we should talk about this and we were fascinated by these videos because we held this kind of insider knowledge that we've been talking about. I've got to give a huge shout out to our PA, Miss Audrey Kaminsky, for talking with me about why everyone else who isn't necessarily enamored by this information, why do these discussions even matter? And Audrey made a great point by saying that for a lot of people, these celebrities and these home tours or private collections are the only ways in which people know about some of these artists and could potentially inform the little information someone might know about the visual arts. So it matters that we talk about display, ownership, accessibility, etc. for these celebrity-owned objects because this may be how some people think and take part in the art world. Maybe the only thing that people know about Kahende Wiley is that he painted the Obama portrait because of Lance's video, or that James Terrell makes installation art because of Kendall Jenner. And the power that these celebrities have to actually influence others' perceptions of the arts is not to be discounted. Yeah, and I think I would also stress too in what I said in the first episode as well, is that this is also a good time to be self-reflective and self-critical as well, and analyzing your own home and your own space, and if that space is really reflecting how you truly want to operate in that in relationship to your art as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I hope that this discussion on the feedback doesn't feel short or cut off. I think a lot of times Gianna and I are talking to you for an hour based on casual conversations that Gianna and I just have at home or together. So our intention is not to cut off or dismiss topics, but to start something. And I hope, we hope that they continue into your spaces as well, just like they have into ours. I'm extremely grateful for all of these comments. I think that dialogue and learning and exchanges are so important to all of us for the continual progress of our platforms and for Art Pop Talk too. Like we want everyone to experience art in whatever format that may be. And we always wanna hear from you and have you all keep enlightening us and call us out when you know we're being hard on Lance Armstrong. So. <laughs> This was great for us in the end because it helped us to check some of those problematic and nosy art historian personae that we inhibit, <laughs> where Which we is... feel the need to comment on things that aren't ours. And that's just, isn't that what all art historians do right. anyway? We just like talk shit about stuff. First of all, we don't make any of it. <laughs> all of these art historians out here are just critiquing a bunch of art that they have no idea how it's made <laughs> no right like <laughs> like we actually don't know anything and there's a great article that i love um from an art historian where she talks about how <laughs> art history is made up oh know? dude like, no it totally is but you know, we, like we are essentially writing stories well because all of this and talking about these spaces everyone's going to have a different perspective on it because talking about installment art in general is going to be subjective like that is just the name of the game and we are part of the art bullshit <laughs> that <laughs> takes place in this line of work but because of the knowledge we have obtained through our degrees our career our overall experience we are very hypersensitive to the installment and care and the handling of historical objects both for myself as an art maker and as an art historian, I think sharing our sensitivity on those issues or moments was, I think, very important, but it also didn't allow us to get fully into the art, which is at the end of the day, what we wanna be talking about. So with mm -hmm. this in mind, yeah. Bianca, for today's Art Pop Talk, we are going to discuss the work of American painter and sculptor Kehinde Wiley. We were skeptical and concerned for the Wiley piece that hung above Lance's stove, but we actually didn't even get the chance to dive into Wiley himself that much. So we are going to take a little break 
And when we come back, we will be looking at Wiley and some of his recent monumental sculpture. Everybody. I hope you had a good break and are ready to talk about Kahende Wiley. Ooh. Bianca, I am pumped to talk about Kahende Wiley's work today. Both Bianca and I have been able to visit his work in person, and Oklahoma was lucky enough to have the traveling Wiley exhibition at the OKC MOA called A New Republic in what I think like 2017 is when it came here. Mm -hmm. A fantastic exhibition highlighting not only his figurative paintings, but his busts of black figures, as well as these incredible stained glass backlit portraits. I mean- The stained glass was my favorite for sure. Come on, fantastic. Since the Oklahoma City Museum of Art has had that exhibition, they now own one of his paintings, and Mm -hmm. 21C Museum Hotel in OKC had a painting and a bust on display for a while as well. And then the Philbrook Museum in Tulsa has a painting in addition. So we are really fortunate to have these works here and have been able to discuss Wiley in museums within our own state, our own kind of landscape, and can now have a discussion about the work and the artists on the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. So let's do it. Kehinde Wiley is a painter best known for his naturalistic portraits of African-American men in historic poses. Exploring painting in college, he did his undergrad at the San Francisco Art Institution where he got his BFA and then he received his MFA from the Yale School of Art. He was born in California, but after doing his master's, it seemed he felt really connected to the people and the landscape of the East Coast, where he now lives mostly, and having one of his studios in Brooklyn in his early works, which started his exploration of photorealist paintings with his stylized floral backgrounds, first consisted of portraits, again, mostly of men who he met in Harlem. As we discuss the operations of Wiley's artist studios and his practice, it is going to be important for us to know that Wiley is combining a wide range of references from classical paintings to pop culture, which is just one of the reasons why here at APTHQ we just absolutely adore him. So through both his own interests and through his formal training, he developed an interest in Renaissance and Rococo paintings and has become known for appropriating works and famous portraits by replacing the original subjects with contemporary black figures. His works are splices of original or foundational classic Western paintings and are elaborated or embellished with the influence of Islamic architecture, uh, African textiles, as well as contemporary fashion and urban hip hop, which is displayed through the model's clothes or the highly decorative backgrounds in the paintings. Quickly, I wanted to think about the word appropriation. This can be really tricky and is constantly moving and is a concept that is always evolving, but I'm going to use a definition from the Tate and break it down just briefly. Appropriation in art and art history refers to the practice of artists using pre-existing objects or images in their art with little transformation of the original. So this sounds like a pretty basic concept, but sometimes appropriation is being used just to be done, just because you can, but mostly Mm -hmm. there is a conceptual and more purposeful reasoning for changing the original visual image or source. This could be done to show your own perspective or change the meaning of the piece entirely, etc. But if you're going to use appropriation, that original source will always be tied to your work because we will not be able to understand fully your meaning or concept without knowing the meaning or concept of the original. So they will essentially be tied together for eternity. So we will dive in, (laughs) which is fun. As we dive into Wiley's work, we need to be thinking of how and why he is consciously deciding to appropriate these works. 
Gianna suggested that we talk about the painting Morpheus, which is an oil on canvas from 2008. This will act as a kind of quintessential example of Wiley's early work. And I think, Gianna, that's a great call because you're right in that it shows not only the style that he has become so known for, but is exemplary in its ability to show the complexities of race and gender Mm -hmm. being presented to us as viewers through both an art historical and a contemporary lens. Morpheus is a painting that's approximately 9 feet by 15 feet. In terms of Wiley's work overall, the scale is very important because it references classic Western history paintings. Something along the lines, for example, of Jacques-Louis David's neoclassical painting The Coronation of Napoleon from 1807. Now, this is not the piece being referenced in this work, Morpheus, by Wiley, but Wiley has referenced David quite a bit, notably in his Napoleon Crossing the Alps. This scale that Morpheus is on, this 9 feet by 15 feet, is a contemporary painting that exists to distinctly recall a scale that was reserved for images of historical significance. In the image, we see a black man comfortably laying on his side, softly gazing up at the viewer with this almost coy look on his face. The man is laying on a silky sort of fabric with a background of really endless floral patterning. It seems kind of eternal in its depth. He is wearing a red tank top, a cap, sagging jeans, which allows us to see some of his boxers, a gold chain around his neck, and sneakers. And here's a quote from an article on the piece. The subject's urban style, coupled with his African-American male identity, yields a captivating image of contemporary African-American culture represented in traditional European portraiture. So immediately, we have Wiley placing a contemporary Black man in his contemporary dress at the scale of a traditional Western white historical painting. This painting, Morpheus, is called that because it is reference to a painting by Pierre Narcisse Guérin. I'm not sure if that's the right pronunciation, so please forgive me. Sounded right. (laughs) Morpheus and Iris from 1811. This is a classical mythological reference in which we see a white male figure lounging gracefully and very sensually Mm -hmm. on a white fabric. Something that I particularly love about Wiley's work is also his ability to not only confront race, but to simultaneously confront gender constructions as well. On Wiley, speaking about his own sexuality, he said, My sexuality is not black and white. I'm a gay man who has occasionally drifted. <laughs> and thinking about his own personal identifiers, I think that this so it, it's so strongly echoed in his work. In many of his paintings of black men, including this one, Morpheus, we are visually meant to wrestle with the idea that black men and boys in white Western culture aren't thought of as being soft and emotional and affectionate. So I'm going to read another description here of the piece. The colorful floral background of this piece and relaxed body language of the subject is inherently subversive, rebelling against the patriarchal, white supremacist, heteronormative, and hyper-masculine institutions of oppression and the vilification of African-American men. It's these concepts that is precisely what I meant earlier in reference to Lance's piece. Maybe without being totally conscious of where my feelings were coming from, I was so concerned that this reevaluation of the canon that Wiley is bringing is being overlooked because of the Obama association. That's exactly why it matters that Wiley did do the Obama portrait. The portrait doesn't just look different because we have the first black president being shown with an abstracted floral background, but both the sitter and the artist are making a statement about American culture, racism, gender construction, and systemic change. 
Yeah, I'm really happy that we talked about this piece. And I think also mostly because of the scale, which I'm really happy that you mentioned and giving a black body that kind of monumental space to inhabit, which historically was not given. No. It's incredible. And also scale is very powerful for a number of different reason- reasons, mm-hmm. but also making you confront that. So I think also to those motifs that we have within the floral patterns and with the connotations that come when you're wrapped in white fabric, that idea mm-hmm. of purity and softness, you don't typically see that surrounded within a, you know, a portrait of a man, but that's also why I find the original piece of Morpheus also so interesting. It's also a little bit different because Morpheus being like a god that Mm -hmm. becomes a little bit more different when talking about just general representation of like European men. I I just do find it so, I don't know, compelling. Just, Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of like at a loss for words just because yeah, I don't know of how and much I, mean, I love and, this piece. And being yeah, able to and, also see this one in person, mm-hmm. I mean, it was incredible. Also thinking about he's not, the figure sitting in this piece is not a nude, but thinking about that yes. idea of the re- reclining nude and thinking about how gender is expressed through body language Mm -hmm. is also very interesting. I think that can also be said for the rest of Wiley's work too. You know, he doesn't really work with nude portraiture. All of his models are mostly wearing some form of clothing because that's a marker of some form of identity. Cultural identity. Yeah. Right, exactly. So, So now that we have learned about Wiley's concepts and goals in a more familiar medium. The piece that we are going to discuss next is going to be a statue, which will expand on the conversation we had on the podcast about Confederate or slave owner sculptures or statuesque monuments perpetuating an incomplete view of our nation's history as they take ownership of public spaces. This work by Wiley is a direct response to a Confederate statue in Richmond, an idea that was sparked in 2016 and was completed in 2019. This is his largest sculpture to date. It's called Rumors of War, and it stands at 27 feet high and 16 feet wide, and it's made of bronze, and I believe the base is made out of granite. So this was big, big news when it first was Mm -hmm. unveiled in Times Square, in September of 2019, so almost a year ago. Reading from the Virginia Museum of Fine Art, Wiley conceived the idea for rumors of war when he visited the city in 2016 for the opening of A New Republic. Rumors of War takes its inspiration from the statue of Confederate Army General James Ewell Brown, or Jeb Strout, created in 1907. As with the original sculpture, the writer strikes a heroic pose while sitting upon a muscular horse. However, in Wiley's sculpture, the figure is a young African-American man dressed in urban streetwear. Proudly mounted on his large stone pedestal, the bronze sculpture commemorates African-American youth lost to the social and political battles being waged throughout our nation. Also, this piece is interesting in comparison to the Morpheus painting because Mm -hmm. this work, although the idea was sparked in 2016, draws from his other series of paintings and his early works from the 2000s where he was inspired by this history of equestrian portraiture and this idea of, you know, the classic kind of European propaganda, masculinity, all of that he plays in very, very heavily into his work. So... He replaced this traditional white subjects, you know, depicted in in a large format painting, you know, with, again, young African-American men in street clothes. So at the time, these works were a reaction to the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Nearly two decades later, Wiley's public sculpture, this Rumors of War, now is taking its name from a biblical phrase found in Matthews 24, 6, which addresses the violence that continues not just in the Middle East, but every day on the streets in this nation. So the goal of rumors of war is also the same 
as his paintings or even his other sculptural work, which is to depict a more truthful, transparent, and inclusive American history. And I think also in regards to particularly this sculpture, I just think a more worldly view as well. Yeah. One mm -hmm. which includes fair visual representation of Black people. With this being a monumental public work, Wiley, I believe, is taking his concept to the next level by holistically challenging our nation's identity by again taking this visual claim and stake in the landscape. As mm -hmm. we know from my prior conversation, the issue is also that these oppressive and racist monuments have the same ability and hold this power of, you know, public influence as well. So knowing mm -hmm. this, we can take this analysis of the installment further. So the first time that rumors of war was shown was premiered was actually in Times square and then right. it was moved to the grounds of the virginia museum of fine art where it's now permanently installed so as right. wiley has been a longtime resident of new york and most of his early paintings were influenced by this landscape in the black community here it made a lot of sense to premiere this piece close to home you know, also providing the opportunity for a very public and diverse crowd mm -hmm. to see it in person. And right. then again, I think, you know, a very direct way for him to connect to his community before it again being permanently installed in Virginia. Mm -hmm. But moving to Richmond, where it was finally installed there in December of 2019. It's situated near its appropriated Confederate statue and actually other Confederate monuments in the city's Monument Avenue. So instead of replacing or tearing down these statues, the installment's message became a different way of challenging the influences of Confederate monuments by acknowledging systematic oppression and racism in the state and assuring that Black and brown men and women will be a part of visual, cultural, and historical narratives by claiming their own spot in the state and in their own nation. Now, with this being said, in light of the recent Black Lives Matter movements, I do not know if those original Confederate statues are still there as of this moment, but this is the mm -hmm. original concept behind the piece and also the dialogue that the Virginia Muse Museum of Fine Art wanted to have with Kehenna Wiley, and, and that's how they wanted the piece to interact with the space. Right, right. That's also fascinating to think about if these monuments surrounding Wiley sculpture do get removed, what the conversation will evolve to mm -hmm. be. Yeah. Yeah. I This statue is gorgeous. You know, I don't know another term to describe it, but of course, Mr. Anthony Mason on CBS This Morning has done an interview with Wiley about this piece and the unveiling at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. So. Yeah. Also, Wiley said something that... I, I don't know. I think that I, I really like the way that he talks, the way that he speaks in his interview. He's obviously very well spoken, but um, also kind of chill at the same time. I don't know how yeah. to explain it, but he, you know, he's using these people and these models and, and hiring and commissioning them to, you know, stand for him and to pose for him. But mm -hmm. different from the idea of what like a statue monument is, is celebrating that person, you know, Wiley's work is like, this is just a dude that I asked to model for me. This isn't celebrating one yeah. particular person. It's celebrating the idea of, you know, and uh -huh. the presence of Black people in in our country. So he oh, was just like, this so is good. just a dude. He's just here <laughs> like, for all of us. So Thank good. you for being here. So I don't uh. know. <laughs> So before we wrap up, I also wanted to mention a fantastic article that I've read for a few of my art history courses. Um, I think I've been assigned to read this article like three different times in school. It's by an art historian um, named Krista Thompson. So I'm going to read the abstract for you. I'm I am not sure like the level of interest that our listeners have in reading those kind of art historical article. So I just wanted to reference this one. I think also it it carries so well, very um, interdisciplinary. So anyway, I'm just going to read you the abstract. Contemporary visual expressions of hip hop have popularized approaches to visibility among black youth. These practices emphasize the effect of being seen and being represented. 
especially the optical effects of light and shiny reflection. Studio artists Kehinde Wiley and Louis Gisbert draw on these representational strategies of hip hop to refashion art history, bringing the painterly techniques that created optical illusion in late Renaissance and Baroque painting, especially to the surface of their work. They also use hip hop's visual language to highlight the surface aesthetics of race and the hyper visibility of blackness in contemporary consumer culture and the blinding limits of visuality. It's such a good <laughs> article. It's so good. I cannot recommend it enough. Again, I just, I wasn't sure kind of what everybody's comfort level was. Everyone's, you know, our listeners and thinking about art historical, like scholarly writing. Thompson is currently working on Black Light a manuscript about Tom Lloyd, electronic light, and archival recovery in African-American art, and the evidence of things not photographed, which is a forthcoming book that examines notions of photographic absence, fugitivity, and disappearance in colonial and post-colonial Jamaica. I read that. I was like, I mean, damn, I've <laughs> got to get my hands on this book, and I really <laughs> I need to talk to this woman ASAP. So the link to this article will be on our resources page. You can create a free JSTOR account if you don't have one already or one through your school's library system if you're a student. So definitely check that out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love a good scholarly article, I must say. Oh, I'm, I need some. I'm sure that the person who schooled me on mindfulness will be giving me some homework soon. So well, at least I'll have some readings to do. You know, for next time. Oh, for next time. Well, you know, I've kind of been a little bit bummed because everyone is like starting school soon and I'm like, oh, I'm I'm not starting school soon. I'm kind of like <laughs> sad about it. I miss I like school. I know. But if you need a break from school, I guess for everyone who's starting up, you know where to find us for your much needed mind breaks or maybe we don't give you a mind break i'm not sure what we do for you in your life but we are here for you whatever you need oh my gosh how exciting to everyone starting school my students start classes this week so i'm very excited for them i'm excited to all the students going back in whatever capacity that may be yeah absolutely so you all know where to find us you can follow us on instagram and facebook at art pop talk and as always, you can email us at artpoptalk at gmail.com. And with that, we will talk to you all on Tuesday. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.